Final Fantasy XIV has dozens of options for how you can play. From hardcore raiders to relaxed crafters, the game offers something for everyone. But at the end of the day, it's an MMO, so you have to rely on other players. Whether that's for your daily duty roulettes, or something as simple as making gil on the market board, you can't play Final Fantasy XIV without other people. Or can you? So the question is, how far can you get in Final Fantasy XIV as a solo player, with as few exceptions as possible? This is my Final Fantasy XIV Iron Man challenge. To make this as challenging as possible, I've set some rules to prevent anything that would take away from the difficulty. I can't queue for dungeons, roulettes, or trials with other players or NPCs. All trials and dungeons have to be run solo, unsynced. I can't party, trade, or ask for assistance from any other players. I can't use the market board, I can't hire retainers, and I can only purchase items from NPCs if I'm unable to craft or obtain it myself. A not-so-official rule that I used to make it slightly more fun was avoiding using gear from quests and only using crafted gear or gear from dungeons when I remembered. Starting on day one is simple. Create the most beautiful character on Eorzea, pick Marauder, spawn into Limsa, and start the MSQ. I picked Marauder since I thought the heals from Storm's Path would be helpful in the early game, but it ended up being a really lucky choice. Things progress as usual until we hit our first roadblock. I need a helmet. Not just any helmet, an eye level 5 helmet. Marauder ended up being the best choice as Limsa Lomensa has access to the blacksmith and armorer crafters, so I could make the helmet myself. I just need to go up and start the quip. Well, okay, fun is over. Time to buy the helmet from an NPC. Hold on. So this text box actually only says level 10 on your class quest. If that was right and it didn't need me to progress to level 10 MSQ, I was set. And so it's time for my favorite class quest, Hit Rock with Axe. I also have a small laundry list of mobs I have to kill from my hunting log to reach level 10 for the next quest, but thankfully they're all close by. So, with the level 10 quest out of the way, I was able to unlock Armorer and Blacksmith. Sadly, as there was no way to get to Uldah without progressing the MSQ, I'm unable to get Miner and collect the ores myself, so the first NPC purchase gets us the lowest level helmet that fills the quest requirements, the Chain Coif. Coif in hand, it's back to business, and first up is fighting off a Gobu with a hot cat girl. After all that excitement, the in-room is unlocked, and so comes the end of day one. Day 2 begins and I've only got one goal, getting to Sestasha. Of course, from muscle memory, as soon as I get my fancy dress shoes from the Freedom Quest, I throw them into the garbage, and moments later realize that I need them. So after being told to beg for another pair of shoes, I mentioned if you were so careless as to misplace them, I was supposed to tell you to get your arms back and beg for another pair. And spending 10 minutes looking for this person who I had never heard of before. It shows it with a quest marker, it just doesn't actually show up on that. Are you struggling to come? You have lost the fine pair of shoes I chose especially for you. Um, fortunately I have another pair available. You may have them out of the kindness of my heart and the loathing in my soul that I bear for your usual attire. I was back on track. With the Lominson Envoy started, I was finally free to access the other main cities and unlock all of the crafters and gatherers. With all cities visited and every crafter and gatherer unlocked, it was time to move on and finally unlock Sestasha. Since I wasn't using gear from quests, I had almost a full set of level 1 gear. If I went in there now, I'd be dead to the first bats I saw. So I had to be at a class level and item level where I could tank the enemies without a healer and manage to kill Fishman at the end. Blacksmith and Armorer are our VIPs to get gear from my Marauder. I wanted to be able to make gear above level 20 and have all of the items I craft be at high quality. To do this, I needed to mine for copper and tin to get bronze. Tin can't be obtained until level 10 mining, but thankfully it's close to the copper spawn. Craft a bunch of items for my blacksmith and armorer, while also making tools for the other crafter classes. A large amount of the crafts required undyed hemp and cloth and maple lumber, so I can't do those just yet. Spend 500 of my very small amount of gill to teleport to Gridania for maple logs to make lumber. Make maple logs into maple lumber. Make some new crafter shoes so I can level up my carpenter and have a higher chance at high qual items. A small interruption. 
What? Now for the undyed hempen cloth. Start by getting tricked by the gathering log and believe that you can get mocha grass from logging, a faint glimpse of hope. Find out it's from harvesting and realize I can't get it without the scythe. Realize that you can't find a scythe recipe with your current levels. Craft more bronze to level up blacksmith. Finally find the scythe recipe. Discover the scythe recipe needs ragstone whetstone. The ragstone needs quarrying from miner to obtain and higher level goldsmithing to craft. The sledgehammer needs ash lumber and animal glue. We'll make some new gear for my carpenter so I can make the ash lumber, gather some bone chips and thanolan, and use some miscellaneous items from killing mobs to make some animal glue, get some ash lumber from a level 10 carpenter and botanist, craft the sledgehammer, realize you forgot to attune to both of the nearby aetherites and so you have to run all the way from Ulta, waddle back over, grab the ragstone, craft the scythe, Subscribe? Wait, that's not part of the crafting suit. Good lord, I can finally collect the level 1 material for Weaver and make the first gear pieces for my gatherers and crafters. Now that we're done with that, we can start with the real work. This was all necessary so that I could make high level, high quality items for my crafters and have a higher chance of collecting the materials for my gatherers. We skip a lot of the gear and go straight for the cotton level, so I have to run over to Gridania again to collect cotton bolts. Do a bit more gathering to get to the next tier of log, and take a pit stop to get all the mini aetherites in Gridania so I can use the main aetherite to just teleport out of the city. Spend an insane amount of time trying to learn how to fish in the first place for fish oil, and then spend about 20 minutes trying to figure out how to get crayfish to craft crayfish ball bait, but I needed crayfish ball bait to catch crayfish for the crayfish ball bait, so I bought it. Spend a million years catching two princess trout, craft some fish oil to upgrade my crafter gear, more crafter gear upgrades so I can craft more crafter upgrades so I can craft more crafter and gatherer upgrades. And now, we're on the home stretch. The last big target is a lot of iron and some other miscellaneous upgrades. Quick upgrades to my blacksmith and armorer tools, mining and crafting high quality iron ingots to level up my armorer and blacksmith, level leather worker and upgrade its gear after more fishing so I can make alt goat leather, hunt down some alt goats and alumen in eastern Thanalan, and then, finally, I can craft the armor for my Marauder. Three total pieces, a head and chest combo, gloves, and a leg and boot combo. And then, of course, stay up a bit later so we can make the weapon as well. And now that I finally made all the gear I needed, I could- oh, um, my Marauder isn't high enough level to wear it. Okay, time for hunting logs. Now I can wear my armor and I'm unstop- wait, one more level for Storm's Path. Okay, this time for real, I got everything I needed, and I finally considered myself fully prepared for Sestasha. Storm's Path is an integral part of doing dungeons solo as a warrior. It lets me heal for one eighth of my health every third GCD without losing out on any damage for bosses. And in case you were wondering, here's how I was feeling at the end of that day. Holy shit, it is 1am, exactly on the dot. 1am... And I am exhausted. Tomorrow, I'm gonna give Sustasha a try. I think these accessories are probably the best we're gonna get. And uh, that took for what's what's playtime? So far, just just to keep us all on the same page. Uh, so far, I've been playing on this account for seven hours and forty minutes. It has taken me just about 7 hours and 40 minutes to be able to attempt Sestasha. Uh, there we go. It took just about 8 hours of playtime to get to a point where I had decent gear to tackle Sestasha with. I unlocked Sestasha at about 3 hours of playtime, meaning it took me 5 hours to craft and gather all of the stuff I needed for level 25 gear. And so, with no energy left and my eyes slowly closing on me, it was the end of day two. Day three, I wake up with plans to make potions and accessories, and it starts with a friend of mine giving me a heart attack. As you know, the rules have it so I can't purchase items from NPCs unless I have to. He mentioned that there's a helmet that I can make as a leather worker from just leather, which wouldn't have needed any NPC purchase if something in the shrouds dropped animal skin. Thankfully though, 
The helmet was eye level 1, and the MSQ required an eye level 5 piece of headgear. The first item on Leatherworker above eye level 5 requires bronze, so I did make the right choice with Limsa. I dug around a bit to plan out what accessories to craft and then decided that, actually, I was probably overprepared as it is. So it was finally time to challenge Sustasha. Unrestricted party turned on, level 26 with decent equipment, and one singular emergency potion to use. I'll admit, I was a little nervous, but it was an early dungeon, so hopefully it wouldn't be too bad. And now, after all that work, it's time for the first real test. Can I handle this pull of two bat? Oh my god, I dodge all their hits. I forgot that was a mechanic. I did actually have to pay attention to the correct color choice for once, but other than that, the run went smooth. I tried out some big pulls and didn't even get that low, so I tried even bigger pulls, which went much worse, but I lived and that's all that matters. Though I did have to run back and kill a clam so I could get out of combat and regenerate HP at a normal rate, right after I was ready for the first boss and honestly, he was a cakewalk. With a new accessory added to my gear, I was confident now that I had, in fact, overprepared. The next boss was a cakewalk. The accidental big pulls from pirates were cakewalks. The third boss was a cakewalk. Everything was easy, and I was glad I had put all the time into crafting. With my last big pull on pirates, it was time for the final boss. I was confident from the dungeon so far, though I knew that Den could summon adds. For a normal party, he would be dead before the first set spawned, but for me, I would have to face multiple rounds of them. I didn't know how much they did, and really, I had never seen them before. They could be stronger than the normal mobs in the dungeon, I just needed to be prepared when the time came- <laughs> Look at all of it. <laughs> Yeah, okay, they didn't do any damage either. There's so many of them. Wait, what the heck? I got experience? Swift completion? <laughs> yeah, experience for an unsanct dungeon. Even though unsanct doesn't reward experience for the actual mobs in the dungeon, it does still give experience for the first time completion and swift completion. Though, I don't know if I would call 17 minutes particularly swift? I won't complain. With a final playtime of 8 hours, I had completed Sasasha. I was proud, though I felt like something was missing. It almost felt like this had been too easy. What was I putting so much work in for if it would just be like this every dungeon? And with that thought in the back of my mind, I started teleporting to complete the Marauder quest, stopped because it costs a lot of money, and then quickly realized that the swift completion had made me absolutely rich. After trying to figure out if I could repair my gear by buying dark matter or not, I decided to just jump into Tamtara Deepcroft and keep the dungeon momentum going. Tamtara is no question easier than Sustasha mob-wise, so I think we all know how this one went. But after fighting off a few big bats and pondering my orbs, we were on to the final boss. I couldn't stun him like Den, but he still went down without much effort, and again I was met with this odd feeling that I wasn't satisfied. But no time to worry about that since we're jumping into Copper Bell Mines and the last of the three starter dungeons. I also accidentally stumbled into an amazing way to level my crafters. So long as the class is at or above the level for an MSQ, I can turn in the main scenario quests for experience on my crafting classes. Before starting Copper Bell, I went to get an axe upgrade. The one I had was making these runs go a lot slower, and I would need one for the upcoming trial, so I set back off to get some iron ore and yew logs to make... Bill. Ah, <sighs> I love Bill. And with Bill's safety in mind, I went over to Ulda to purchase some dark matter from an NPC to finally repair my accessories, and kept a stockpile of grade 3 for my armor and Bill should they ever need it. Copper Bell Mines used to be one of my favorite dungeons to get in roulettes, so I was happy to be here. Just the small tricks to be more efficient were always my favorite. Like, did you know you can ignore all of these starter enemies? They won't chase you to this point, so you can do your first big pull all the way here. Just remember to mitigate since the giant hits pretty hard. And these were the first sets of enemies where even a normal sized pull was getting a bit scary. I got dangerously low a few times in this dungeon, but never to the point where I couldn't handle it. The first boss is a lot nicer now, though it is just run in a circle and hit the boss. I'm sad I don't get to blow up the slime anymore, but I guess it's more of a boss fight now, so no complaints. I like to call this trick, I thought I could sneak past them help. For the final boss, I was ready. The mobs had hit hard up until now, and I wanted a real fight from this guy. But after a while, I tested out the AoEs, and turns out, 
I can just stand in them. With the last of the three dungeons done, I couldn't help but feel like I was missing something. I was proud of what I did, of the work that went into it, but I didn't have the challenge that I was looking for when I started this. And that's when I realized what the problem was. You see, back in 6.0, when the stat squish hit, Square implemented a new version of the Echo attached to the now unrestricted party option. Where Echo would require you to die in a duty and could be clicked off of your buff bar, Epic Echo was with you from the beginning of the duty and couldn't be removed. With the first three dungeons done, and me feeling relatively unsatisfied, there was only one thing to do. Going back to our rules, we have a new adjustment to make. Not only do I have to be unsynced, I have to also have at least Silence Echo activated, but preferably Level Sync if that was even realistic. The plan was set and the new rule was in place, I just didn't know if it was even possible. So with the renewed energy, I charged on towards the final goal for today, Ifrit. The first trial a player is faced with, the moment everyone realizes the power of the Warrior of Light. Of course, to do that, I needed to beat up some bodyguards and pray return to the Waking Sands a million times, but let's not worry about those boring bits. With that long sequence of the MSQ done, it was time for the Ifrit quest. One duty down, and all that was left was to test out my first solo instance with level sync. Fighting Ifrit solo with the level sync modifier was going to be a really unique challenge. This treats the fight as if I had queued for the dungeon regularly, syncs my gear and levels to the max for that duty, but I was still a solo. A one-on-one -on -one battle between me and Ifrit. The true test to prove that solo only was the warrior of light. As you might expect, I ended up dead on the floor. But it was doable. I got a lot of information from the first attempt. After every three auto attacks, Ifrit will use Incinerate, which does a bit over 100 damage. Stuns could be used to gain time for my potion cooldowns, but they didn't reset his Incinerate count. All they would really end up doing is buying me time, but I could stun him out of eruptions. As I progressed through the fight, Ifrit would start using eruptions, which gave even more time delay between each Incinerate hit. In the worst case, I can run after he casts to get time for my potions. With all of this, even on my first run, I made it a lot further than I expected. With no food and mediocre potions, I would gotten him past 50%. My current high potions only healed for 212, so I would need something that could heal for more as the damage just kept stacking up. I also needed to plan my mitigations around his incinerates and count his auto attacks. The high potions is the first problem. I wasn't healing for the max it would allow, which meant I just needed something that could give a higher percentage of health heal. The only option was to grind up my alchemist and make the high potions high quality. The second problem was my lack of food. I needed a food item that could give me a decent amount of vitality and had tenacity as its main stat. Sadly, for both of these prospects, things were looking bleak as my culinarian was still level 1 and my alchemist was level 11. This was going to be a bit of a grind. Starting with alchemy, I crafted whatever I had on hand in the cave before heading out to gather more materials. I finished the Ulda Aetherites and went off into the world to get the mats for new alchemist tools. If I wanted to make high quality high potions, I was going to need some upgrades. Thankfully, the main hand tool was the only one that desperately needed to be upgraded, so with a new alembic it was time to get ingredients. Using chanterelles from Central Shroud to make potions was an easy one, but after that I was at a loss for the best item to grind. A lot of the items for potion crafting required killing mobs and finding strange mats. It seemed like the easiest material to get for this grind was from bats. This was great, as it also showed me that I had completely forgotten to get the Aleport Aetherite. New Aetherite and a few bat materials later, I still needed more levels. High potions were proving to be a higher level craft than I thought. Honeycombs into beeswax, limestone and sand for mortar, and then off to Eastern Lenosha for the annoying items and the biggest XP drop of my life. Uh, 30 XP, whoa dude. Now, I had to scour the beach to find a mod that dropped Jellyfish Umbrella. This was the lowest level option to give it at a whopping level 33, so each fight took a while and they were incredibly stingy on handing out umbrellas. After a while, I got a few umbrellas and, uh, Nida? Nida? Crafted an Ash Wand and I was finally close to the level range for high potions. I threw together an upgraded wand I was never going to use and then used up all of the... Jellyfish bits that I had, and I could finally make my high potions. After a bit more gathering, some new aetherites, and making new tools, 
I had the first ingredients I needed to make my high potions, plus a short excursion to grab some galagomint and other possibly useful cooking spices. After grinding high quality distilled water, I could craft my high potions. In an effort to protect my sanity, after making the first potions I did some short trial and error to make a macro that would get me a high quality potion every time and crafted way more than enough potions. The difference between the high quality potions and the normal potions was around 80 health, which is almost enough for me to just jump back into Ifrit right now. For that final push over the line, we're looking for a food with tenacity. But not just any tenacity, tenacity has to be the main stat. So we're stuck leveling Culinarian until we can find one. And now it's time to get back to the grind. Rock salt into table salt, maple sap into syrup, syrup into sugar, wheat into flour, and some gear upgrades before another NPC purchase. Alt goat milk, and any other milk it seems like for that matter, is only available from NPC shops, so we're off to the Culinarian Guild to get some milk. After a few more crafts from milk into butter and cream, and butter and mushrooms into a sauté, I find the perfect food, walnut bread. Not only was it the perfect stat food, I also had all of the ingredients already, so after one final gear upgrade, my walnut bread was ready to carry me through Ifrit. So that was it. I was as prepared as I could be. Now it was just me, some walnut bread, a few high potions, and Bill. All that was left was to prove we could do it. Slowly getting into the rhythm of it, towards the middle of the fight I got pretty low and was worried it would catch up to me. But once the eruption started and incinerates took longer, it gave me just enough time to heal with potions and keep up with the damage. I actually can't believe it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, I actually did it. That was so good. There's no, there's no way I just did that, dude. What an incredible experience. Fighting tooth and nail with a trial boss, on level, as a solo. This was what I wanted this whole time. Maybe. As the game progresses, it'll be too difficult to continue to do this. But at least for now, this was everything I wanted. And to wrap up, I skipped the remembrance parties, dealt with a crazy parking violation, joined the Immortal Flames, and got the very first mount for this character, Duo, my partner in crime for the foreseeable future. This took a staggering amount of time, but there's still so much more we have to do, so many more challenges to overcome. And for the first time in a long while, I couldn't be more excited to play Final Fantasy XIV. I really enjoyed this fun little game mode I've made for myself. Let me know if you enjoyed in the comments. Maybe you leave a like, since this took absolutely forever to make. Hopefully, I'll be back soon to continue our adventures and see just how far we can go.